Hey guys, it's your favorite gold miner, prospector, and geologist, Jeff Williams. And I got a great surprise for you guys today, because today we're gonna be exploring the infamous Catherine Mine, huge gold producer. And I'm gonna explain to you how you can use this type of an operation to help follow up using Google Earth to find your own gold deposits. I know it's crazy, so let's get into it. Remember I told you there was five basic deposition models? This fits into one of them. And I'll go into detail here in a minute, but right now, I wanted to tell you how this one was found because it's a really interesting story and why they had to stop mining it here. There's still gold down there, but you ain't getting it. In 1900, in the Union Pass Mining District, gold ore from the Sheep Trails Mine was hauled to a mill on the Colorado River to be processed by way of a small, lonely dirt road. About midpoint on the journey, this dirt road passes by a small granite knob that protrudes from the flat alluvial plain next to an old wash. One day, a teamster by the name of S.C. Baggs, who was hauling ore to the mill from the Sheep Trails mine with his father Stanley Baggs and John Vanderberg, saw tiny veins of quartz in the small granite hill and stopped to investigate. Upon closer inspection, they found quartz veins with small amounts of native gold in the samples and decided to send them off for assay. The samples were found to assay at $30 a ton in free gold and in September of 1900, the new mine was christened the Catherine after the sister of S.C. Baggs and daughter of Stanley Baggs who operated the mine for several years. The new Comstock Mining Company, along with the North American Exploration Company, with whom they leased the property, developed the Catherine Mine down to the 300-foot level in 1904. In 1919, when Catherine Gold Mining Company took over, the mine began to attract a crowd to the Catherine Camp. Single miners and married men were lured to the town by the possibility of fortune and as part of the promotion to lure a population, a free town lot was offered to the first couple to have a female baby and name her Catherine. Total production of the Catherine mine through 1933 reached 1.7 million in gold and $100,000 in silver. By 1934, the Gold Standard Mining Corporation employed 40 men and had a 300-ton capacity mill treating 60 tons of ore a day, including ore from the nearby roadside Arabian and Tyro mines. The ore values in the Catherine mine are practically entirely all in gold, which is free milling and average values of $14 per ton, were based on large, low-grade tonnage, with several lenses five to six feet thick, were encountered on the 100-foot level, running as high as $100 in gold per ton, with the average width of the vein being 15 to 35 feet. On the 200-foot level, the vein averages from 30 to 65 feet in width and carries an average value of $14 per ton, with some areas of the vein assaying as high as $122 per ton. On the 300-foot level, Several six-foot lenses was found that carried as much as $300 per ton when gold was selling for just $20 an ounce. In total, the district yielded more than $3 million of which 85% of that was in gold. And since then, multiple leases tried to work the site, including William Ground of Kingman, Arizona. But by 1942, Rising costs involved in ore extraction and government regulations in the form of Executive Order L-208, issued by the U.S. War Production Board, forced the mine's closure. When the pumps were shut off, the main shaft was flooded with water from the Colorado River, and the Catherine Mine has since been reclaimed with BLM plugging the main shaft. The area where the head frame once stood has been replaced with a water pump and tank that supplies water to the nearby homes of the town site of Catherine. All that is left of the mine and mill site today are large concrete foundations where the mill sat and fields of tailing piles that came from the mine.
All right, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna explain everything you see out here. So we're gonna start first with the shaft. Now the main shaft is right about where I'm standing, okay? But they had to fill it in and cap it. They don't want anybody falling into it. And of course I completely agree with it. Yeah, they made this huge cut. This is why they were cutting into this. This is fabulously rich with a whole bunch of stringers that were carrying gold. A lot of this infill is carrying gold in it. And I'm gonna go over the geology here in a second, but I want you to see where this vein here was part of this vein here, do you see that? And then you have a fault that runs this way. They call that fault jogging. It has basically jogged and shifted and split that vein in half. So a lot of times miners, they'll be chasing a vein and it, it disappears because the fault has split it and they have to do core drilling to find it. But I'm gonna get into the geology in a minute, but I want you to see where the shaft is. Now you can see where they bulldozed a lot of the material over to cover up the shaft. And over at the mill, they would run it through a series of jaw crushers and ball mills. And if you look around, you can actually see the balls that they were using to crush the ore up. And that's a great example of what the ore looks like. Look at that. Oh, you see all that hematite in there? Oh. After they would crush it, they would run it across tables and they would get all the, the heavier, chunkier gold out of the mix. And that's really important. Then the material that would come off of that would go into a series of troughs and over into this huge tank right there. It's called a thickener. And you can see these, these columns, these pillars here. Now, this was a huge tank and it was usually made out of wood and it would sit on top of those little platforms down there. And then across the top, you would have I-beams that were suspended across here. And then that is how they would stir this and thicken it. And they would add cyanide to it. And then the material that was cyanided out would go over to those tanks. Then they had a whole series of tanks over there. And then that way they could collect up all the pregnated cyanide so they could run it through a marrow crawl process. Now, a marrow crow process is really simple. It's just basically they're using zinc to help get the gold to drop out of solution. You want to know more about the marrow crow process, I'm going to leave a link down below. And some places still use it, but now they use activated carbon and, of course, resin ion exchange process. And some companies are experimenting with a biodegradable leaching process. I'll go into that later. If you look in the background, you can see the monstrous piles of tailings that came from the mill. Now, think about it. Everything you see there came out from under our feet. There's huge chasms underneath us, huge stopes. And I'm going to explain why they stopped mining here because that's an interesting story too. But I'm going to keep taking it around and giving you a tour before we get into the meat and potatoes of it. Now up here sat one of two ball mills. You can see the foundations of where the two ball mills sat. And here's a schematic of where they actually were. You can see the classifier that came off to the side there. And there's the foundations for the second ball mill. Now the first ball mill sat here below the ore bin. And you can see the drain tube right there for it to feed into right there see that here's an aerial shot of where the westinghouse motor sat that ran those ball mills and then they would power it with these westinghouse motors that sat right here and you could tell because look at the conduit pipe for the electricity it's right there massive the crushed ore from the blade crusher came up this big conveyor belt that went up to the top of the ore bin which would feed the ball mills and here's an aerial shot with an overlay so you can see exactly how everything was laid out when they were in full operation. And what's cool is look at this, right underneath the structure is more of the vein right here. This is incredible. And you can see where all the other settling tanks are sitting right here. Now, while we're on the subject of these foundations, I'm gonna go into something in great depth that nobody talks about, and I've never seen anything on YouTube about it. You see these a lot on the mounting for anything big and heavy and industrial back in the old days. So you'll see the actual mounting bolt itself, and then you'll see this pipe. You'll see it a lot. See, there's, there's one there, there's one there. And the reason why it's built like this is because they, they had an idea of, of the footprint of the piece of equipment that they were going to put on this concrete foundation. So they knew about where these bolts should be sitting in the concrete, but they needed a little give and take. So when they put it on, if they're off by a little, they can wiggle and move it to get it into the holes on the base plates of this huge equipment. So they would put it inside of this pipe. This pipe goes down and of course it's anchored below with a platform. That way they can move this bolt, this mounting bolt back and forth to get everything set. Then once it's in place, they would put epoxy in there to seal the deal so it doesn't move around at all. So if you see those, that's what they're for. Ah, uh, you know what that is? There's one there and there's one there. They had a stairwell running up right here. And here looking from the other side, you can see exactly where the head frame sat 
And down here is where the massive power plant sat. There's a guy right there for scale. This is where the massive generator sat right here. Look at the size of that marker. It's huge. There's the pipes to get the water out of the mine. Those things are huge. See the elbows right here? One went up, one went down. And here's one of the footings here and here for the head frame, massive head frame that sat up there. And look at all the stock works and swarms of veins, all this infill and cross cutting. Look at that. So you can see that this is all hydrothermal emplacement. Look at the size of that infill. It's a monster. Imagine all the different episodes that it took to create this infill. But as you can see, you've got just multiple episodes, generation after generation of infill. There's a huge piece of it there. And then you can see some of the wall rock that's broken off and is actually in place in the infill. See that? And if I had to guess, this is the richer section of this infill. And this probably has nothing in it at all. See that? Just tons and tons of stock works running through here. Here's a good example of crustiform banding and coliform banding. Look at this. This is typical of a hydrothermal emplacement vein. That's the bottom of somebody's shoe. We've got a really big shoe for you tonight. You know, I had to throw that in there. Directly from the east, if you draw a straight line from the Catherine mine, you're gonna see this big pile of mine waste or waste rock pile. And you can see that they had their powder shack in it. That's really clever. And I know you're thinking, Jeff, why the heck would they drop a shaft out here? There's nothing for miles. You're absolutely right. It doesn't look like there's anything for miles. On the surface, when you draw a straight line between the Catherine mine and these rhyolite domes and vents, see them? Then it starts to make sense, don't it? Because the vein never disappeared. It's under our feet right now. And the engineers knew that. And so they dropped a shaft right on top of it. And yep, they did find gold. Not a lot, but they did find gold. Now this is where I'm going with this geologically so you can get out and find your own deposits. A lot of times if you just trace out the faults, you can actually find out where there might be a hidden deposit just mere inches under the surface. Surface. And you can find some of these other rhyolitic domes and vents that could have gold on it in the middle of nowhere using Google Earth. You getting the picture now? So that's why I'm telling you all this is so that when you have downtime in the winter, you can actually start mapping these areas out using Google Earth along with geological maps. And you can actually start to trace out some of these deposits. You can find something that was missed. You get out there and prospect and get your own gold mine. And if we have time, we'll get out to those other rhyolitic domes. All right, we made it over here to one of the rhyolitic domes, which is that little monka right there. They're really easy to spot. And right here, look at this beautiful feeder dike. You see it? Right here. It's a no brainer. And what they were doing is they were trenching here and they were going to cut right into the dike right here because it's got some beautiful iron oxides in it, but I don't think it had enough values. Now I'm not saying there's not more inside of that monker and you can see there's holes all over this thing, but obviously it wasn't enough to keep their interest. And if you look out across the alluvial plain there, you'll see another rhyolitic dome. See it, that little vent? And when you look at a geological map, you'll see the fault running right through here. And there's about 10 or 12 more of them over there. And if you had the knowledge of knowing where they're at because you've done the research, looking at geological maps, and you've also looked at Google Earth and you know the geology of the area, you put all the fault lines together, you're gonna to be on a winner, I'm telling you right now. I've got a small little prospect right here, you see it? Where they tapped in to this beautiful red rhyolite and that looks juicy. They didn't find anything else as they went in. And so places like that are a great place to sample. Maybe they were a few inches away from something big, or maybe the grade of that material is high enough to make it profitable for you. And like I said, always do your land status first. Check that, because you don't want to be on somebody else's claim. Struck a ridge, yeah, on Bob's claim. One of the biggest questions I usually get is, Jeff, why is there gold in rhyolite? What makes rhyolite so much more special than say basalt? Well, that's gonna be for another video, okay? And it all comes down to Bowen's reaction series. Oh yeah. Oh, that looks really good, doesn't it? Look at that, 
tons and tons of hematite in there. And I got some inclusions in there too. Look outside of any of the portals or the collars of the mines. Portals are the outside structure that holds the added open. And the collars are the structure that holds the top of the shaft open. What you're gonna do is you're going to look for any piles of rocks that don't look like they should be there. Like they've just been thrown in a little pile. Those are referred to as high grade piles. I tell you that in all my videos. You're gonna go through there and pick out the juiciest pieces. Now you can either take it home, crush it, screen it, and pan it yourself in some jet dry and water or you can simply send in the pieces in a bag to a laboratory and have them assayed if you don't want to mess with it and i'll leave a link down below to one of the ones that we use now if you see that the grade is too low like say three quarter of an ounce per ton and you don't want to mess with it or maybe it's got sulfides in the mix or it's got other materials in there you don't want to play with you can always still claim up that area and then you can sell it to a mining company or maybe you can sell it to another miner who has the skills and the equipment to get the gold out and make it profitable for them you see where i'm going i know lots of people who do that and they make a lot of money doing it and look here's a blm pls marker right here that way you know where you're at on your sections and that's what you need to look for when you go to file a mining claim i would come out here and i would probably do a little core drilling with a mini core driller or if you want you can get yourself a hammer drill an sds plus and you can actually drill into there, collect up all the cuttings and then pan that out. Look at this outcrop. Oh, isn't that nice looking material? This whole dome is filled with it. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I see a huge portal over there. You see it? And then it looks like mine dump and I'll bet you there's a shaft over there too. So you know what I'm gonna say, huh? So come on, let's go. Now, when we did the research on this mine, we couldn't find hardly any information on it except for the name of the only mine out there, which is a shaft, is called the Sunbeam Mine, which was a gold mine, predominantly AU, with no other commodities. When we got close enough, you could tell that there was also an adit driven in to one of the rhyolitic domes. But a closer inspection, you could see that BLM has already got out there and beat us to it, and they put up a back gate in there. When you get close enough, you can actually see back in there where it goes about 20, maybe 30 feet. And right on the inside here, you can't tell, but on the left, it actually makes a quick left to get up underneath those rhyolitic vents. Now, look across here, you can see all those little pieces of debris and concrete. I think they had some kind of a small milling operation out here. Looking at the shaft from above, you can see the sinkhole where the shaft is slowly opening back up. And there's this huge amount of waste rock that they pulled out of the shaft where they were trying to get up underneath these rhyolitic vents. Now, when we sample this, there's trace amounts of copper. And of course, there's a lot of hematite staining on the rhyolite, which is great for gold. And of course, this shot, you can see that there's not one, but two rhyolitic vents right next to each other. And, and there's extensive sampling and open pits and cuts and trenches all over this thing. So they were finding gold here and they were trying to find more outcroppings of it. But I don't think they were very successful because those are the only two mines that we could find in this entire area. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, that's a good one too. See where it was cut into this soft alluvial material? Do you see that? This is where somebody brought a front end loader and they scooped up all this material because they knew that gold travels in this red. And that's what I've been telling you is if you see anything that looks out of ordinary or reds and blacks in the rock, go ahead and pick that up, take it back, sample it. Because you could stumble onto something that everybody's been walking over and that would be your own personal gold mine. You see where they had to cut through all that uh, alluvial material? Because they were trying to cut into that monka right there. Big old rhyolitic dome. And I know there's a whole bunch more over there. I can see about six or seven of them. But that sun is getting low in the sky. Oh, and don't forget at the end of the month, we're giving away a brand new Gold Monster 1000. In fact, we give one away every month. And we're giving away bags of pay dirt from our drift mine with the red worm in it. Yeah. And of course, silver bars. You can't beat that. Now, if you want to get involved with that, all you got to do is look for the little icon at the end of the video that looks something like that. Click on it, make a $10 pledge, and you're in like Flynn. And I'll see you on the next video.